Well, today we're going to get to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and I know there's a lot of you the same way. You love to go fishing, and you know we're going to have a Bible study. We'll do it every week. This will be the first of six, and we're going to follow the commandment of Jesus in Matthew 4.19, where Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You know, we're not after fish. We're after people. And if we can learn how to fish and we can know how to fish, then we can catch fish. So come on, go with me. Let's go fishing. Get your Bible out and get you a notebook. Get something that you can take a few notes. And we're going to start our adventure. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about all aspects of being a fisher of men. And you know, when we first begin to think about fishing, we need to realize that every time I've ever gone fishing, it's an adventure. I mean, it's something that we're looking forward to. It's something that I'm excited about. And I want you to have the same attitude about being a soul winner. It's not something that we got to fear and dread and, oh, what's going to happen and what are people going to say to me? Let me tell you something. It is going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. You remember that when Philip went down out of Samaria. It says there in Acts chapter 8, verse 5 through 8, it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many, that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, and were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Let me tell you something. When you've got a soul winner, there's great joy involved. I meet so many Christians today there's no joy in their life. In fact, they walk around with a big old long face and some of them look like they've got dead lice dropping off of them. And I'm like, good night. How can you be a born again child of God and be so unhappy looking? Maybe they're not unhappy, but they look unhappy. Well, guess what? When you're a soul winner, great joy is around you. Why? Because if you're winning people to Christ, there's great joy in their heart because they got saved. And if you're winning people, there's joy in your heart because you want them to Jesus Christ. You see, it is going to be a wonderful adventure, and it's going to produce a lot of joy. It's going to give you joy to be a soul winner. And then we've got to realize that if we're going to go on this great adventure, we need to realize that we need to get excited about it. We need to do it and do it right now. Get excited about being a soul winner. Get excited about uh, people are going to get saved and lives are going to be changed. And, and that, that ought to just excite us in our heart that, that we're going to see wonderful things happening in people's life. I remember the first soul I ever won to Jesus Christ. I was probably just 15 years old. I'd only been saved a year, and I went to youth camp one summer in Kentucky at a camp outside of Somerset, Kentucky. And after the morning preaching service, 
I went back to the dormitory, and it was just me, and another boy walked in. He was a year or two younger than me, and he came to me, and he said, Kent, you know what? I don't think I've ever been saved. I don't think if I died today that I'd go to heaven. And I remember, I tell you what, my heart stopped right there because I thought, you know, the first thought is, well, I need to go get a preacher or I need to go get a, one of our counselors. But then I thought, you know, I've got my Bible and I know how to lead someone to Christ. And I took that Bible and me and that boy, we knelt down at one of those bunk beds in an old cabin there at a youth camp and I led that young man to Christ. That was the first soul that I ever led to Christ and I'm going to tell you it excited me. Why? Because when you win one, you want to win another and then another and then another. It's just like fishing. You take me fishing and we start catching fish. I don't want to go home. I want to keep fishing and I want to go back next week and I want to try it again and I want to get a better pole and I want to get a better lure and I want to catch fish. And you need to realize that we ought to be excited about it. You see, Jesus Christ, he told us in John 3, or 435, he says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes on the fields, for they are white unto, are they're white already to harvest. You see, if somebody comes to you and they say, man, the fish are really biting out at the lake. Right now, they're practically jumping in the boat. You don't say to them, well, you know what? I think maybe I'll go out there and try it in four or five months. Maybe this fall, I'll go fishing. No. If someone tells you the fish are biting and they're biting now, man, you want to get out there. You want to get in to it. And that's the reason Jesus said, there's nothing to wait on. There's so many people today, and even in our churches, they're, they're like, well, one of these days, I'm going to be a soul winner. One of these days, I'm going to go out and try to lead someone to, what do you mean one of these days? How about today? The fields are white. That means the crop is out there, and every one of us, I don't care what city you live in. I don't care what country you live in. The fields are white. And there's people out there that need Jesus Christ. And it will surprise you. There's many out there that are seeking Christ. But nobody has won them. Get excited about it and realize now's the time. I remember several years ago, I flew into my hometown in Chickasha, Oklahoma on a, on a Thursday afternoon and that night was our church visitation program, and I, if I'm in town, I always like to go. And so I went to the church, and and Pastor Hayes was our pastor then, and and we had an odd number, and he put everybody two by two, and then it got down to me, and there was nobody to be my partner. And uh, he said, Kent, do you mind, could you just go by yourself tonight and make a few calls? And he gave me a few cards of some visitors that had come to the service. And I went to the house of one and had a really good visit at that house. But as I walked out of the house, out to my car in the street, I looked across the street and I saw the house of a man that we'd been praying for for a long time that I knew needed to be saved. And I thought, you know, it's late and I probably, you know, I need to get back to the house. I've been away from my wife and kids all week and, and she's holding dinner and I'll, uh, I probably, but I thought, no, I need to walk over there and ring that doorbell. And I walked across the street and I rang the doorbell and his wife came to the door and 
And I said, hi, I come by to see your husband. And uh, I just wonder, uh, is he here? And she said, no, uh, Brother Ken, he's down at the gym. He's down working out on his, on his weekly workout down there. But he'll be back about 9 o'clock. Would you come back? And I just, without even thinking, I just said, well, sure. I'll be happy to come back. And I remember as I'm walking to the car, I'm thinking, why did I say that? I mean, I've been gone all week, and I need to see my wife, and I need to be with my kids, and it's late, and it's getting dark, and I don't want to come back at 9.30. And uh, so I got to the house, and Julie had dinner on the stove for me, and she put it on the table, and she said, aren't you going to change clothes and get out of your visitation clothes? And I said, no, I promised uh, a lady that I'd come back and talk to her husband at 9 o'clock tonight. 9.30 and uh, she said really and so I ate my dinner and I sat around the house and I played with the kids and watched TV and visited with Julie and then I said oh I better go and I got in the car and I drove over there and I went up to the door to ring that doorbell and I expected him to come to the door wearing sweat pants and a sweatshirt just coming from the gym and I'll never forget he he was all cleaned up, had a nice sweater on, his hair was all combed. The living room was straightened up. His wife and his son were in the back where they wouldn't bother us. And he said, come in and sit down, Brother Ken. And we sat down there on the couches. And he said, I want to tell you a story. And he began to tell me about how very recently his grandfather had died. And on his deathbed, he looked up at his grandson and said, Am I going to see you again? And he said, I'll never forget. Those were the last words my grandfather ever said to me. Will I ever see you again? And, of course, I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking, well, this is going to be the perfect uh, entry to what I want to talk about. And so I looked him in the eye, and I said, well, let me, and I called him by name. I said, are you going to ever see your grandfather again? And I'll never forget, he looked at me, and he said, isn't that the reason you're here? <laughs> I felt kind of stupid at that moment because, yeah, that was why I was there. And I said, yes, that is why I'm here. And I'd love to show you how you could see your grandfather again one day in heaven. And I took him through the plan of salvation and we knelt right there on the couch. And he called upon the name of the Lord. And he was gloriously saved that night. Oh, I'm so glad I didn't tell his wife. Well, you know, I'll be back in town in three or four weeks. Maybe when it's a little earlier in the evening, I could come by and see him. Or maybe I could make an appointment to see him. No, the fields are white unto harvest. And right now is the time. And we ought to get excited and say, I am going to become a soul winner right now. I'm not putting it off any longer. I want to be a soul winner right now. Well, you know what? If we're going to go fishing and we're going to be a soul winner, the one great news I have for you is this. You got a fishing buddy to go with you. Now, I love to go fishing, but fishing's one of those things. It's not as much fun if you don't have someone to go with you. And if you've got a buddy that can ride in the boat with you or go on the bank with you, it's always a lot more fun to have a fishing buddy. I always think of the story of the two fellas that went fishing out to the river. And uh, they were sitting out on the river bank. The only problem was it was Sunday morning. And one of them started feeling a little guilty. And he looked over to the other and he said, You know, I really should be in church this morning and not out here fishing. And his buddy looked over at him and he said, well, 
I couldn't go to church anyway because my wife's sick. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes a fishing buddy, he's that little bit of encouragement that you need to keep going. And guess what? The Lord has given us a fishing buddy that we are never out there all by ourselves. See, the, before Jesus ascended back into heaven, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, which we call the Great Commission, he says, Go ye therefore. And when he says, Go ye therefore, that verse actually means, As you do life. As you do your life. During the day, at the job, in the neighborhood, over, uh, out at the sporting events. As you do life. Teach all nations. And that word teach there, it means to preach the gospel, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and win them to Jesus Christ. And after you win them to Jesus Christ, then that verse says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. See, there's a progression. You win someone to Christ, then once they get saved, you make sure that they understand baptism and they follow the Lord in believers' baptism. But then we don't just drop them there. It says after that, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, and I want you to get this part, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Look at there. Jesus says, yes, I'm ascending right now. I'm leaving you. But I am sending one to never leave you. And you know who that is? That's the Holy Spirit of God. And every day as a Christian, the Spirit of God lives in our heart and we have him right there to help us and to guide us and to direct us. And I'll tell you many, many times I have been out uh, uh, talking to someone about the Lord and um, Words would come to my mouth that I hadn't thought about in years. Verses that I memorized years ago. They would come straight out and I would think, who was helping me? Well, I'll tell you who was helping me. He says, I am with you always. We have a fishing buddy that never forsakes us. He's right there with us all the time, guiding us, directing us. I think so many people People are scared to death to witness because you're so afraid that you're going to get out there and someone's going to ask you a question and you're not going to have the answer. You're not going to have the right answer. You're not going to know enough. When I went to Bible college, my roommate, he was going to go and be a missionary and uh, after going through four years of Bible college and graduating, uh, I thought, now he'll go and become a missionary. But you know what? He said, I just don't think I know enough. I just don't think I have all the answers. And so he went off to another university, and he got his master's degree. And I thought, okay, you've got your master's degree. Now, go to the mission field and win some people to Christ. And he told me on the phone, he says, I just don't think... I know enough yet, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to seminary, and I'm going to get my doctorate degree. And, and he went to seminary to get his doctorate degree. And, of course, all of this education that he was taking, his bill was getting bigger and bigger. And in the meantime, he got married, and he had a few kids, and life began to take hold of him. And he went to work for a large one of the largest Wall Street companies in America. And he was making good money, trying to pay off his education and trying to pay off his new home and take care of his wife and kids. And sadly, he never, ever went to the mission field. Let me tell you something. You're never going to know it all. 
You're never going to have ever answer. But the Holy Spirit of God, He will help you. I remember when I graduated from Bible College, my first church I pastored, I was out knocking doors one day, and a lady came to the door, and I thought I was pretty smart. I had my degree. I had all the answers, and right off the bat, one of the first visits I made in Kalamazoo, Michigan, this lady looked at me and said, well, preacher, let me ask you a question. If we're all in heaven, and we're all naked, could you pick out Adam and Eve and Man, I have never heard that before. They didn't teach me that in Bible college. And, oh, I was thinking, what kind of answer does this woman want? And I said, well, will, will they have fig leaves? And we want. And she looked at me with a big grin on her face. And she said, they'll be the only two without a belly button. Because they were not born. They were created. And all oh, me and her had a nice big laugh there on the porch. But that was a question I didn't know the answer to. And I'll tell you right now, there's been questions that have been asked to me. I didn't know the answer. But I could go to God and I could say, Holy Spirit, teach me, guide me, direct me. And I'll tell you what, he is that fishing buddy that will never Leave us. I am with you always. Well, fishing is an adventure. And this is our first lesson, and we're just starting our adventure. Over the next several weeks, I'm going to take you through different steps. In fact, the next week, we're going to actually plan out where we're going to go fishing. If you're going to go fishing, yeah, you got to decide where are we going to go. Where are we going to go to go fishing? And we get our maps out and we look at our fishing spots. And uh, we check the almanac and we see where will we go fishing. And we'll be looking at where to go fishing next week when we get together again. The thing is today, I want you to bow your head right now and say, Lord, I want to be a fisher of men. I want to win one soul to Jesus Christ. I want to go fishing. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week.